Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining GP Bullhound's Titans of Tech online event. I'm Jade Williams from GP Bullhound, one of the organisers of today's webinar, and I will just run over a few points with you so that you know what to expect from today's session. Firstly, a little housekeeping. Today, we will begin with the presentations of the key findings from the report by GP Bullhound's managing partner and founder, Manish Madhvani. This will be followed by a panel discussion led by GP Bullhound's Alon Cooperman and his guests, Dr. Ali Parsa of Babylon Health, Alexandra Pro of Quanto, Reshma Sahoni of Seedcamp, and Julie Ranti from VivaTech. The webinar will take about 60 minutes and we will share the recording with all attendees after the session. During the webinar, you will see a poll popping up on the screen. This poll is anonymous, so please don't be shy and let us know your thoughts and ideas. You can close the poll window when you have answered by clicking on the X. If you have any additional questions after the session, please email events at gpbullhound.com. We will begin shortly, but before I hand over to Manish, we would like to play you a short video. Hey everyone. So this is um, this is one of my favourite days of the year when we get to present the Titans report. Um, when we first set up the business way back in '99, uh, one of the key missions that we said we'd try and achieve was to really raise the ambition levels of entrepreneurs across Europe. And then this report has kind of um, been created and, and has gone through many changes that acts as a barometer of how successful we've been doing. Um, and it it's always gives us some interesting insights. So we'll whiz you through some of the key findings. And I think the, um, the mission of this report is to show the progress we're making to creating some really global titans in tech. And then to also try and share some of the key learnings from some of the best entrepreneurs. You've seen that, seen that amazing list of entrepreneurs that have participated and sharing small tips that hopefully allows um, many of the entrepreneurs listening in to, um, to steal and borrow a few good ideas. So first of all, I think one of the um, tech has obviously been in, in the news and has really helped keep the world connected over the past few crazy months. Um, one of the questions we're, we keep being asked is, is tech pandemic proof? And I, I think what we've seen when we look back through the history is that the tech sector has moved and had to move so quickly um, pivot, new competitors, new technology coming into the world, that they're, they're very used to turning and creating new business plans almost on the fly. So what we've seen over the past few weeks is some, some real um, innovation and pivoting on a, on a very fast um, nature. So firstly, just a few examples. Fortnite, everyone's seen their kids um, being homeschooled by Fortnite and seeing how they've really captured the, um, the wave. 350 million players have now come onto the platform. One of the smartest things they did was to launch a live concert uh, with Travis Scott that got 27 million um, people viewing in. So unbelievable growth. Zoom, we've all heard about Zooming. Um, the, the growth that many people have missed though is they only had 10 million participants in December. They're now up to 300 million, so an amazing trajectory. 
And then Amazon has gone from kind of being one of the, the enemies of many governments to now being called the Red Cross and really did keep the world supplied. Um, you can see the amazing stack that came through there. They were making $33 million in revenue every hour during the crisis. So a quick reminder of the lingo that we use in the report. So first of all, there's contenders. So these are companies we predict will reach $1 billion in value over the next three years. Unicorns, those that have reached the billion dollar valuation up to $10 billion. Decacorns, 10 to $50 billion. And then the Titans, really the benchmark that we're saying, can Europe create a $50 billion company? Only covering companies founded since 2000. So if we just look at how we're tracking towards that, a spectacular rise in the number of unicorns. So in 2014, when we first started tracking, we were at 30. We've now crossed the 100 mark uh, with 112 unicorns, quite a, quite a staggering number when we think about that. And that's growth of 3.7x and up from 84 unicorns last year. The total valuation valuation of those unicorns has increased from 89 billion to 416 billion. And that's been fueled by total equity raised, which was only $3 billion in 2014. This year, the unicorns raised $40 billion. So a 13 times increase. And that, that's really fueling our, our growth and success. And then the number of $5 billion companies really being able to scale to the next level. Um, we've now increased from six in 2014 to 25. This is the number of unicorns grown each year. So you can see in 2018, it was 13, then 22, and in 2020, 32 companies. Um, so the velocity is increasing. And then Champions League. So this is where we do a bit of a dive into which geographies are really performing and creating the new unicorns. Uh, so in fifth place is Israel by cumulative value. Um, the staggering thing when you look at Israel is the net evolution, the number of unicorns that they created this year, 11, which is in stark contrast to the, the countries you will see that come in at the top of the table, where they are creating two or three a year, Israel creating 11 um, unicorns just in one year, much is being written about the ecosystem there. Um, the next is the Netherlands. I think the thing that really stands out about the Netherlands is only four companies contribute to that $54 billion in value. A lot of that attributable to Agen. So when the Dutch do create one of these, these leaders, they, they tend to grow to a very large size. Uh, Sweden follows a similar path, so $10 billion companies with a cumulative valuation of 70 billion. Uh, the Klarna, Cinch evolving this year, Izetl being some of the best known. Uh, Germany, always uh, in, the, in the top five, um, $16 billion companies, $71 billion in, in valuation, so just ahead of Sweden, and three added this year. And then the UK just hanging on, so $30 billion companies, uh, cumulative value of $87 billion, and three new additions this year. And if we look at the, um, the new additions to the club, so many names you will know, some of the um, speakers delighted to join us, Babylon obviously joining us, and then much has been written in the press about players like Acronis, um, Vinted, and we'll do a bit of a deep dive, Glovo, um, into some of those in the following slides. What you can see is five companies have dropped out. These were all publicly listed companies where the market cap has fallen below $1 billion. Some not a surprise, obviously Trivago covering the travel sector, Funding Circle covering the lending market, um, but then also extending to other sectors, software, fashion, and online advertising. So when we look at the, um, the new kids, so really to do a bit of a deep dive into some of these, one that really stands out is Lemonade, um, founded only in 2015 and already filed for an IPO now. Um, really disrupting the insurance industry. So have gone after a segment that is really underserved. So the renters um, of property. Um, this has allowed them to really carve a strong niche and bring a, a portion of um, people that wouldn't typically take insurance, now taking insurance. And that's driven quite impressive revenue growth. Uh, when you look at how they operate, they've invested a lot into creating two chatbots, which they, they have fondly named. Um, and these chatbots really take you through the process of sign up to take the premium out in the first place. 
and then when you're making claims really takes you through automates that process um, in a really efficient way and that that's been driving a lot of the growth in COVID, they accelerated their market share because many of the larger insurance companies weren't able to keep the call centers and the operations um, running in a safe way because of social distancing. And Lemonade, because of these chatbots, were able to run really without a hiccup. So saw some of the growth that we saw um, from some of the leaders earlier on in the presentation. Um, to cover a few more, this is I think this is why we do it really. We, we love to see new unicorns growing in countries that haven't historically had a strong tech reputation. So Lithuania really created its first unicorn this year with Vinted. Um, Vinted, I think a lot of people saw it founded in 2008, so it's been around, uh, was born, the founders um, were getting frustrated with not being able to sell their designer clothes and some of their clothes online. And really we've seen the um, secondhand clothing market and the circular economy take off in spectacular fashion, Vinted being one of the, um, the key players. What we did see though was they went through a classic um, strong growth and then the market really um, went away from them with competition and some issues. They then brought in a new team and performed a spectacular pivot that I think a lot of us saw um, and executed in, in, in really efficient manner. Um, they effectively took away the sales fees from the sellers and pass them on to the buyers, um, coming up with a novel buyer protection fee. This then meant inventory flooded onto the platform and it caused a 230% increase in, in monthly sales when they did this change. Um, they've now gone from strength to strength. So 225 uh, million registered users, 180 million products listed, and a forecast um, GMV of, of goods flowing through the platform of 1.3 billion, so spectacular growth. Lithuania has created $6 billion of value um, amongst its startups, and we're seeing people like Vinted, like Bolt. Um, we were fortunate enough to wor work with Baltic Classifieds Group on their sale to Apex, um, and really emerging as a, as a hotspot now. Quite, quite impressive for a country with a population of only 2.8 uh, million people. Um, just moving on, one of the subsectors that we're seeing Europe really start to become one of the market leaders in, and I think we're going to be writing and viewing this um, in more, about this in more detail in the future, is really the professionalization of, of content creation. Two companies really, so Miro uses artificial intelligence to make um, anybody's raw photos into a professional grade quality. They then sit in a marketplace that allows you to sell that and you can see the, the spectacular numbers there. Lightrix, I think many of us have used it without knowing who Lightrix are. So really Facetune is the selfie editing software and app that people have subscribed to in massive droves. Um, they've now extended that out to small businesses um, and have got more than 3 million paying subscribers. So, so really creating a new category. And now I'm gonna hand over to Alessandro, who's gonna give you a bit more of a deep dive on some of the sector trends we're seeing. All right, hi everybody and thanks Manish. Um, so in this section, we're gonna dive a little bit uh, deeper in, um, in how, you know, how our cohort of, uh, of unicorns really divides up by sector and where really uh, we see some interesting trends. So uh, first of all, here, here we see on the page um, how, we divide, uh, how we divide in the main sector, enterprise, software, marketplace, FinTech, digital media, e-commerce and other. And we see really a big, big, big a continuation of the trends that we saw last year where enterprise software by far and away is taking the lead as the most important, uh, the largest and the fastest growing vertical here in technology in Europe. Um, this year we have 44 companies in enterprise software that have joined the billion dollar club and uh, they added also the most with 15 new additions. So, you know, almost 60%. And, and this makes enterprise software really the biggest category, double the second, which is marketplaces. Marketplaces is still continuing to grow nicely. Um, historically, Europe has been quite strong on consumer internet and marketplaces. So we see this shift to enterprise software uh, continuing like in the US, but we, we continue to see some, some great companies coming out in the marketplaces space. Um, next up is FinTech. 
uh, fintech is really catching up. Uh, you know, Europe uh, is there's been a lot written about the, the structural advantage that Europe had around fintech, and uh, we can see that it's the is the sector that proportionally it's it's growing the fastest with seven additions, sixty five percent. And then uh, we have more stable sectors like digital media, e-commerce and others, which make up the rest and had a couple of additions, uh, but the situation is a lot more stable there. Um, and now if we if really then go one level further and we really look at what's going on in enterprise software, that's where it really gets very interesting because the um, we see a number of things. I, I think we see a lot of diversity, but one thing that jumped out to us is that uh, over the 16 uh, companies that we added, 25 billion in value, almost 50% of that was in two subcategories. One is uh, data storage, data backup, data protection, and the other one is cybersecurity. Um, I think in the in the data storage uh, space, um, you know, there's been a lot of growth there, uh, fueled by uh, the complexity of the technology ecosystem and the, just the sheer amount of data available. And um, we had some great conversation and there is a great interview in the report with, with Acronis, which is a bit of a different story in the sense that uh, it's a company which has been built uh, bootstrapped and, and really built profitably from day one with roots in Europe, in Asia, and, and relatively recently in, in a later stage of their life, uh, they attracted you know, a large investment from Goldman Sachs. Um, in cybersecurity, we, we all see how top of mind it is now for businesses. And I think what's, uh, what's relevant here, what, what we found interesting this year is that three of the companies there that joined the club this year are coming from Israel, which has uh, got a very strong heritage uh, in, in security and intelligence. Um, next up, there is communication. I think an interesting company there uh, is a company called Cinch, which um, in a way it's, it's quite an emblematic European story uh, because we've seen in the past that uh, European companies have um, have been able to create a lot of value also through acquisitions, and um, and there is no exception for Cinch. Cinch the business was actually called CLX, and um, in 2016 they acquired the business called Cinch. We were fortunate to to be advising Cinch on that transaction in that case, and and the acquisition was so strategic that CLX rebranded the whole business. Uh, to Cinch, and um, they, they've they done a number of acquisitions after that to expand their products and expand their geography footprint, which has generated some amazing performance and it's been really rewarded in the stock market. Um, and then if you go down the line, there is, uh, there is a good amount of diversity uh, companies in finance, in data analytics, in a collaboration space, which is getting a big boost, of course, with remote working uh, and then marketing and content. Next up, uh, if we instead look at the consumer internet sector and what's going on, we've seen before that um, e-commerce is relatively stable compared to the marketplace sector. And we can see this very big structural shift here if we look at the data. Uh, you see in the purple, this is the, this is the value of, of e-commerce business models, direct to consumer e-commerce, where in the light blue, uh, you have the value of the marketplaces. You can really see e-commerce is growing nicely. It's growing from sort of 20 billion to 30 or so over the last six years. But the really amazing progression has happened in marketplace, which have grown fourfold. And you also see the number of logos there, how many new companies join the club. And, and also their value is, has grown faster compared to e-commerce business. There's a number of reasons for that, and we're gonna go into that into the next slide, but it, 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 I think it's a su structural shift which is happening at every size in the consumer internet spectrum, but we're seeing it a lot also in, uh, in, in, the, in the later stage businesses. And we can see this shift uh, quite clearly here if we look at the categories uh, of marketplaces over the year. In, in 2015, the A company's 18 billion in value was very concentrated around two sectors. One classified, uh, very, uh, very few like old concept, um, uh, still working extremely well. Uh, Rai moved to in real estate and Avito in general classified, which uh, we had a lot of fun working with it, investing in over the years. And then we had what I would call um, first generation uh, restaurant marketplaces like Just Eat and Delivery here. And then there is a little bit of travel, a little bit of mobility and far-fetching fashion. But if we look at what's happened now is there is explosion in terms of uh, diversity, in terms of verticals that these businesses have been able to address. 
Um, food delivery is by far the largest. Uh, it's, it's a sector which is more mature, is more competitive. Uh, just eat, still there, now merge with takeaway, and takeaway has really become the consolidator in this space. They recently acquired Grubhub, which one is the biggest platform in the US. Uh, and then you have some, some newer generation entrants like Deliveroo and Grobo really shaking things up and, and growing really fast uh, in Europe and international. Classifieds are still there, they're still growing. But a lot of the value that was uh, captured by classifieds before, it, it's going to specialized verticalized marketplaces, which offer more features and better experience to, to the customers. And, um, and so a lot of the spend has moved there and also the, in general, the online spend has grown. So there is a lot more space to grow. And we see that, we see that there is, um, there is some mobility champions uh, like Bold, Cabify, Flixbikes, uh, the fashion verticals growing nicely, uh, managed, managed vintage. And, and what's amazing about marketplace is that you can also deliver services on top of goods and you can bundle services and goods together better. And so then you have companies like Babylon, uh, which is doing an amazing thing in healthcare, or you have other services like Get Your Guide, et cetera. Um, last I'd like to mention is um, a, a category which is small, but there is a lot of investment going on, which is uh, used cars. Um, Auto One has been the leader in that, but very recently uh, there's been um, Kazoo in the UK that just last week has uh, become the fastest entrant in the, in the unicorn club uh, in the UK with this uh, amazing end-to-end -end service to deliver used uh, car to uh, your door. Um, and moving on, I will hand it over again to Manish uh, to uh, talk about the march towards the first time. Right. Hi, everyone. I'm glad we get a break because we're moving through this pretty fast. It gives us a bit of a chance to, um, to catch our breath. But we'll keep up the intensity, so please um, keep up with us. This is really the chapter that assesses how are we doing um, versus the challenge that we set Europe's best entrepreneurs. Can, can we really create a $50 billion company in Europe? And this will give us a bit of an update. Um, when we look at so tech titans, those that have been valued since 2000 at 50 billion, so creating huge amounts of shareholder value, we now have eight globally Unfortunately, none in Europe yet, but as you will see, we are getting very, very close. Um, these are the ones, um, the ma major changes that have happened in the past year. So Baidu has actually fallen out, kind of the darling of the, um, the Chinese stock market. What's happened there is there's been a huge fall in shareholder value and accelerated by COVID because the crisis really drove a lot of advertising away from Baidu, which is a generic search platform to much more focused and specialized apps like TikTok. And that, that's obviously destroyed value from 53 billion down to 33. Uh, Didi is still a titan at $56 billion. And Uber also hanging on in there at $57 billion. A new entrant, um, we'll speak a bit more about this, one of the Chinese um, conglomerates that's showing spectacular growth, 24 billion to 73 billion. Uh, ByteDance, which we've all been following and seeing on TikTok, uh, really internationalizing the business now and coming up with lots of new, um, new strategies. Um, rumors in the market that tra shares are trading at over 100 billion in the secondary market, but not, not confirmed yet. Um, and then another new entrant from China, Meituan. Ant Financial. Tesla has had a huge surge. I think we've all been following that story. Um, and coming back in as a, as a new entrant at $150 billion now in value. And then Facebook's still the, um, the leader out there in front. Um, so one of the, um, we love to highlight some of the new titans emerging. So Pinduo Duo is the Chinese um, player. I think when the founder described it, I saw him on an interview, um, he described it in the most fascinating way that you kind of had to dig into the company. He said, what I am building is a combination of Costco with Disneyland. And you kind of try and work that out in your head and you can't. So then you have to go onto the platform and watch videos of it. He's created a huge marketplace that sells everything from heavily discounted iPhones 
to groceries where you're buying direct from the farmers. Um, and then all of a sudden, as you're doing this shopping, kind of the full range of the spectrum, there'll be online games that will suddenly pop up and you can win discounts and, and win money. So it's quite, a, um, it's quite an interesting experience. Um, it's only five years old and already it's doing more volume than eBay. The valuation has increased by over 100% in the past three months. Um, there are fears of a bubble because they are heavily loss making because they're subsidizing a lot of the um, iPhones and other goods that are sold and quite heavily dependent also on advertising. But you can see the, um, the revenue growth there from 260 million to, to the 4 billion in, in a very short period. Uh, when we look at Europe, so this is an, a couple of years ago, we predicted that there would be a Titan created in 2021. It looks like we may actually have that earlier. Spotify has been on a tremendous tear um, and similar to Pinduro Duro, the valuation has increased and doubled over the past three months. Um, what's driven that is their massive push into podcasts and the signing of the exclusives with people like Joe Rogan and then the Warner Brothers superhero content. That's really changed the, the dynamics of the whole company. If they continue with monetizing on the podcast side, it will change the margin structure. And that's what the market is really re-rating them because they have to pay 60 to 70% away on, on the music royalties. It looks very likely that Spotify will become a, a $50 billion company this year and very closely followed by AdGen, which has also had a tremendous march. Um, so looking, looking good. I think the, um, the European entrepreneurs have had a, had a really strong year. I'm now going to pass over to, back to Alessandro, who's going to cover the, um, the funding scene that's really allowed this progress. Great, thanks, Manish. I like this relay. I feel like I'm on the last sprint. It, this will be uh, a quick data heavy session, but it's really important because it addresses the, the final piece of the puzzle, which is the funding. Uh, I think in the past, uh, European companies were comparatively underfunded compared to Asia and US businesses. And if you want to really compete and lead the innovation globally, that, that holds you back. And so uh, what we've been tracking is what we call late stage funding, which is rounds over 50, over 100 million. And, and we've seen a very nice progression over the last few years. In 2017, there were roughly 7 billion invested in these type of rounds, 50 rounds. Good growth in 2018 to 8 billion and 70 round, but the real step change happened last year with 19 billion invested over 135 rounds, so over double. And, um, and this is absolutely essential uh, for these businesses, which really seize the opportunity and, and, and they they see that white space and they want to move extremely quickly. Um, and what's also encouraging to see is that this is continuing also this year, despite the pandemic, uh, we're seeing quite a resilient scenario um, where in there's been good growth. This is, this is year to date from January to May, a number and value of investment. And we see some good growth from 18 and 19. And then in 2020, um, where stable on 2019 in terms of number, slightly down in terms of value, but still double what we had in 2018. So still very healthy, very resilient. Um, European companies have been quite judicious in using their capital and they've, they've been supported by existing shareholders and new shareholders uh, investing into them. Um, next up is where are investors putting their money? Uh, so we looked at the last uh, year and a half, 24 billion invested and how, how they were allocated by sector. Th this mirrors quite closely also the new addition. So it's no surprise to see that um, most of the capital is going to enterprise software and fintech. Enterprise software by far um, has the, the widest range of companies being founded and also the widest uh, pool of investors, I would say. And there's a lot of appetite in, in the various uh, sub verticals of enterprise software, and we've seen that firsthand because um, in the in the last six months we we closed two of these large deals with uh, Ecovadis and Signavio being our clients raising some large expansion rounds. Um, in fintech, um, 
still very large amount of fundings, probably fewer deals, but larger uh, than in enterprise software. Uh, the new generation banks are still raising a lot of money, some good activity as well in payments and uh, other areas of fintech. And marketplaces here, they're here to stay. What's interesting there is that a lot of the funding has gone into services marketplaces and they always there food delivery. And then the rest accounts for just over 10% of the investment. So it's very clear where the smart money is going at the moment. Um, and finally, in this section, we're gonna take a look at where, where the capital is coming from in terms of the investors. And um, what's very encouraging to see is that um, there, there's a very good um, wide pool of different investors. The, the lion's share 70% is coming from growth investors, uh, a lot of European ones and a lot of US and Asian investors, which have seen how attractive the, U, uh, the European ecosystem is and really uh, have set up offices that put teams on the ground and they've been investing heavily in Europe over the last few years and they've been reaping the returns. Um, next up, corporates, they've been quite active. Um, for example, uh, investing into marketplaces, we have uh, Airbnb investing, uh, we have Amazon um, investing Deliveroo and also in, in companies like uh, OLX and Rakuten. Uh, in FinTech, we have banks, insurance companies still being quite active. And, and also the, um, the automotive OEM uh, have been very active as well in, in the mobility space. Um, next up, um, alternative funds, public equity. Um, this, the, this is a pool of capital which has been quite active in the US and we see that in Europe as well. Uh, BlackRock, Blackstone, uh, investing more and more earlier stage and, and really adding value to a lot of businesses and, for example, in the financial services industries. Uh, Tiger Global have been doing that for a long time. And um, the last pool of capital is sovereign wealth funds. Um, a few of them have been long-standing players in Europe, like Temasek. Um, we also had the other uh, Singapore fund, GIC, investing in checkout. And for example, we had Mubudala as well recently uh, leading around in global. So overall, it's a very healthy, diverse uh, pool of capital, which offers different values and different alternatives to the company to select their optimal mix to grow. Um, that's it for me today. I'm going to hand it over to the juicy bits, which is the predictions and the contenders uh, for Titans of Tomorrow with my colleague Alon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Alessandro. Right, the next section is Titans of Tomorrow. We're looking at uh, companies that we believe have the most uh, potential to become um, the next billion dollar companies over the next two years, um, or as we like to call it, the contenders. So we started doing this first uh, in 2018, um, and now we have uh, a little bit more data so we can start uh, ranking ourselves and see how well we did. Um, so if you look at the 2018 cohort, of the top 10, 70% of uh, those companies have indeed um, become unicorns to date. So that's uh, not a bad achievement, 70%. Uh, in the UK, we would uh, call it a first, um, but I guess uh, there's still room to, to improve there as we like to get close to 100. And, and if we look at um, this year's uh, cohort of 50 companies, um, if you analyze which, uh, which geographies these companies are based and in which sectors they operate in, um, we could start having a sense of where do uh, earlier stage investors are putting their money in the hope of discovering the next unicorn. In terms of geography, UK and Ireland, France um, and Germany are the top three regions, um, accounting for around 60%. And this is in line of what we've seen uh, over the last few years. In terms of sectors, enterprise SaaS, fintech, and cybersecurity are the European hottest uh, sectors at the moment. Um, and this is slightly different to what we've seen a couple of years ago, which was primarily um, marketplaces, uh, e-commerce, and digital media. So we are beginning to see a shift uh, in terms of uh, sectors. And without further ado, um, these are the top 10 contenders uh, this year. So con congratulations to Conto, 
um, the uh, Paris-based um, uh, business uh, neobank think, um, uh, Stockholm-based uh, open banking, uh, and World, world um, uh, Helsinki-based uh, food marketplace. So well done. And just a little bit uh, about the methodology that we used, uh, we're looking at three variables essentially, scale, velocity, and sentiment. So scale is um, based on public av available information, how many employees those companies have, and um, how much capital have they raised over the last five years. Velocity is the growth rate uh, in these two variables. And when we analyze more than 400 companies that have raised more than $20 million uh, over the last few years, we narrowed it down to 100 companies that we believe uh, have the most potential. But then, and this is where the sentiment kicks in, we sent this as a survey to more than 150 uh, industry participants this year and asked them to rank the companies and choose the top five that they have the most potential to really get a sense uh, real time um, of uh, where investors uh, rate those companies. And we overlaid that information uh, onto getting uh, the top 50. So here we are. These are the top 50 uh, European, European contenders uh, this year. Uh, some companies to highlight, um, Alan, Believe, Personio, Cree, and many others uh, are companies that we believe have uh, a ton of potential and we'll be following very closely. Um, we'll be interested to see which company becomes the first unicorn, which company can become even the first titan. Um, the race is on, no pressure. All right, and now we're going to move uh, into our panel discussion. Um, and I'm very uh, proud to have here with us uh, four uh, very exciting panelists, all who are, um, have built uh, exceptional businesses in Europe and are a driving force of uh, technology and innovation. So the panelists are um, Ali Parsa, founder and CEO of Babylon Health, Alexander Prot, co-founder and CEO of Conto, Reshma Sohoni, co-founder um, and managing partner at Seedcamp, and Julie Rant, um, member of the founding team and managing director at VivaTech. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi, everyone. All right. So let's uh, let's kick off this panel. So maybe we can start with um, Ali at Babylon Health. So Ali, you have started Babylon uh, in London, uh, and it is today a multi-billion dollar business uh, with presence in the US, um, Asia, and Europe, of course. What has been the secret to your success, and to what extent building a healthcare company out of London has been uh, an advantage or perhaps a disadvantage? Um, thank you. I don't know about success or a secret. Frankly, the secret wasn't following the rules because I wasn't given the memo about my background or I didn't follow it. My apologies for that, I should have. Um, uh, look, we all try to build our businesses the way that fits our personalities and who we are and what we stand for. So when we built Babylon, we kind of came up with very three basic principles, which I think is true for any business anywhere. And we wrote it on our door, which was uh, in addition to our mission, but this was our principles, which was um, uh, dream big, build fast and be brilliant. And I think we stuck to that really hard. So in my view, it's really no point in trying to, it, it's, uh, trying to do something small. Uh, it's, uh, it's a big job, it's as hard to do as a small job. Running a, friends of mine who run a small shop work as hard as I do. Uh, so, so it's part of that is just the size of the dream you have. The second part is I'm old, I'm older than most people here. And, and I'm in my 50s, so I don't have much time left, I, I, the way I look at it. So speed and a sense of urgency really, really matters. Um, it's always an argument that you could do something slower, but it's important to do it fast. And then in contrast with that is this concept of doing it right, not cutting corners, not 
accepting shortcuts, not accepting the second best. Is this concept of building something that is better than, than, than anything else is out there. I, I think, it's not a secret, I genuinely think building a business is like building a house. Uh, it all depends on what's your plan. If you plan a big house, you build a big house. Uh, and then what tenacity you have to go through it. Um, and I just finished with one single thing on that. And that is, we have a series of behaviors in Babylon that we try to push really hard in the way we react with each other. And the first and foremost is compassion, is empathy. We're in the business of healthcare. And being kind to each other, being empathetic, having compassion goes with our territory. But I also find having a rule of that no nastiness or no, no bad people are not tolerated is really important. So we have this rule that everybody who joins Babylon uh, after they do their interviews, they have to kind of pass a panel. And the panel asks three questions. But the last question of the three is, would I let them bring up my children? And I think if you stick with people with integrity in your team, you usually end up doing really well. Good people do good work. Thank you very much, um, Ali. That's uh, very inspiring. Maybe as a follow-up to that, have you seen any impact um, from Brexit, having a uh, base in London? No, but that's partly because I haven't seen Brexit yet. <laughs> that makes sense. All right, um, moving to uh, Alexandra. Um, so Alexandra, you're revolutionizing business banking for SMEs, um, and it's not an easy task, but uh, you've had a tremendous success in France, and now you're moving to other European countries. Um, do you see the European fragmentation uh, as more of a challenge or an opportunity for you? Um, well, I, I think in our case, um, it's, uh, you know, uh, for any company trying to scale across Europe, it's of course a bit of a challenge because you have different regulation, different cultures, different languages, obviously. Uh, but I think in our case, uh, the, 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 probably the, the funny thing is that it's probably easier to scale across Europe than to scale across the US if you're a FinTech, because as, as most of you may know, in uh, Europe, you can passport your license, whatever license you have, whether it's a banking license or a payment institution license or an e-money license, versus in the US, it's a state-by-state -state license. So it's somehow more complex to scale across the US if you're in insurance uh, or if you're in the banking industry than, than in Europe. But the other, the other you know, dimensions, again, such as language and, and national, let's say, um, uh, behaviors or you know spe specific stuff are are, are still uh, different. But I think in our case, that's also why we focused on eurozone countries uh, because of course same currency, uh, same payment system makes it much easier to scale. Thank you, Alexander. Um, moving on to to Julie. Julie, you've been running uh, VivaTech for the past four years, and it's now one of the biggest and most successful. Uh, conferences in Europe. Um, first of all, what was your vision when, when you've uh, been in the founding team uh, in the beginning? And um, nowadays, how, how would you compare the European technology ecosystem to those uh, in other uh, geographies and regions? Hi, everyone. Uh, so our vision when we created Vivitech uh, four years ago was really uh, to create and together under one roof all the innovators in one place, uh, innov investors, startups, large companies, academics, to make sure they would collaborate together, they would innovate together, and they would invent new solutions for the common good. That was the mission that drove us uh, since the beginning. And we also wanted, uh, since uh, day one, uh, to accelerate the emergence of European champions, of European digital champions. And in four years, I've seen an increase uh, in, the, in the velocity and in the capacity of scaling of startups in Europe that is really impressive. You, you've shared some figures, but there's just one that needs to, to be, to be uh, said again. Uh, we have multiplied by four in only five years the number of unicorns in Europe. That's really impressive. Um, and, and I think there are some key elements that uh, really stand out. The first one, we mentioned the sectors, and I think Alexandre is an example of that. We are very strong in B2B, in enterprise software, and in fintech. 
But more recently, we've seen that in Europe, we have been able to raise some tech for good startups at the level of scale-ups and maybe unicorns tomorrow. If we look at the contenders, the list that you've shared, uh, there are many startups that are open classroom, um, that give free online uh, courses, benevolent AI that use AI to accelerate drug discovery. There's back market or vintage uh, in the circular economy or audio uh, to help reduce food waste. So a lot of examples of startups which aim at doing good, helping preserve our environment, uh, being driven by a societal and really inclusive mission, but that also has the ability to scale. And that's uh, really important because investors more and more follow them. There's a higher customer demand uh, from the B2C side, but also on the B2B side. You mentioned earlier Ecovadis, it's a good example of the B2B demand uh, on a more uh, tech for good segment. Uh, and I think this is a path that is going to, to increase. And then if we look at the other uh, specificity of Europe, uh, um, Alexander mentioned it uh, briefly, it's regulation, uh, which is another uh, really uh, specific uh, aspect of Europe. But when you look at GDPR, at first you can look at it as a constraint. And you, you, you can say, well, it's really complicated. It's a lot of work. I need to hire a data protection officer, etc." But in the end, I think it was a very good decision and I think it creates new business opportunities for startups because now it matches a customer expectation. Then it helps startups to internationalize in some countries such as Brazil, Japan, South Korea that requires that kind of uh, privacy for data. And it also creates new opportunities to work with government who are trying to implement those solutions. And finally, I think the, the the last um, key success factor of Europe, I would say it's our talents. Uh, we are seeing a lot of uh, successful entrepreneurs uh, around here. We have a great quality of uh, academics, of university, especially in science. And um, that's why I think uh, Europe has really the potential to uh, compete with the, the Chinese and the American ecosystem in the, in the years to come, if we manage to accelerate on the on the creation of a more unified uh, market because in apart from fintech uh, it's still complicated for many companies to scale across the 27 different markets in europe thank you julie um, that's very interesting to to really get this holistic view of the ecosystem and now perhaps uh moving on to reshma um reshma at seed camp you uh have backed some of the most successful companies coming out of europe uh, TransferWise, Revolut, UiPath, uh, just to name a few. Could you tell us a little bit, um, how, how did you, how were you able to back those companies so early and, and what are the um, early signs that guided you towards um, choosing those companies and founders? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, probably two words, extremely difficult <laughs> to, to, I think, have uh, to make those decisions early on. Um, you know, I was thinking about the question a little bit when we, I, I pretty much stalked Tavit to, to take money from, from Seedcamp, but really at the time we backed Christo and Tavit, um, they, they sort of had a fake it as you make it uh, tech crunch post saying, look, here's two people sending money to each other. And that was like revolutionary, right? And, uh, and Revolut came in, you know, talking to us about credit card or debit cards for backpackers. It was like, hmm. Uh, and, and UiPath was fascinating because they'd been going four or five years and really trying to transform from services to software. So, you know, all these points, I mean, there, is, there are no early signs to, to go on. Um, but I think kind of looking back, we looked a lot at, uh, relevant kind of tangential innovation. And so I think what, you, what we bet a lot on in the last decade was what's come out of the existence of the iPhone and what's come out of kind of large enterprises getting fed up of probably enterprise software. So, you know, particularly, and by that, I mean, I think we bet a lot on the demands by consumers to want a beautiful product to want amazing experiences and to feel like magic is, is happening. I think when a lot of people experience, you know, Revolut product, especially kind of the, the early days, it was like, wow, can you really do this? And, uh, and I think I've, that, I've had that experience with, with Babylon as, as well um, through, through a couple of instances of like, this is possible, you know? So, so I think we bet heavily on that. And in the enterprise space, we bet heavily on 
humans saying, my consumer experience is so amazing, I want this replicated into, into the enterprise. And in particularly in UiPath's case, as well on sort of the move towards automation. So we, because there's not much to go on with these founders and, and startups, we tend to look at a lot at, at, at what is happening kind of around that will um, deliver, you know, deliver the vision or, or, or delusion that the, the founders are, are, are pitching. Um, and, and then probably kind of last bit, last bit is all three of those sort of founders and, and kind of their, their companies, you know, looking back, I can, I can say that they really stood out. And, and I think what we felt was a real um, ambition, as you know, Ali said before, is like, I don't have time, I've got to move fast. And I'm not here to build a small business. We want, you know, we want to be international, we want to be global. We just want to be build a huge business. And and it it is a decade, right? It's Transwise is ten years old, and um, UiPath is is uh, ten years old. So it, it, it's the ability to persevere um, that I think it's always kind of a com competitive comparison. And for those three, it really stuck out for us that 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 that's what we were backing. Congratulations, uh, Reshma. And maybe as a follow-up uh, to that, so you guys uh, come in at, uh, at an early stage. In what way do you help um, uh, companies at this stage uh, of development? And how does this value add evolve over time as they become billion dollar companies and beyond? Yeah, I think the first thing to observe there is that we, uh, is that we don't claim to be there sort of past heavily past sort of series a, a or b and i think i think traditional vc has tended to hang on too too long and our, our view is you are in better hands when when sort of index sequoia excel and and Bulletin and others come on it's not you know you don't you don't need yet another voice around the table but what we do uh, end up what does end up happening is because we're kind of founder investors it, it, with that first check-in, we do tend to stay on those Telegram, WhatsApp chats and, and have a lot of kind of the, you know, the, the founder journey across that journey of a lot more sort of uh, philosophical questions or, uh, you, you know, other questions. So, but in particularly the journey to up from us to series A, heavily involved on kind of that zero to one, your first product market fit, getting early traction, and really at the point where we have now a thousand founders in Seed Camp Nation is to make each other their customers and, and users. And so you can kind of get your first thousand users at that Seed Camp or your first hundred customers at, at Seed Camp. So that didn't, you know, it didn't exist 13 years. So I think we're also evolving how we bring value to, to our companies. But, but definitely I think a, a key lesson is, is don't hang on too long. There's, there's other people, like you people out down, down the road that are better. I was uh, about to say, thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Um, maybe moving the, um, the virtual table back to Alexander and Ali. Um, from, from a founder's perspective, what, uh, what is sort of the value add that you are expecting from your investors? One of the challenges of Zoom is you never know who should go first. You know? <laughs> so, do you want to go first, Alex? Please. Uh, do you want me to go first or should Alexander go first? Ali, you should, you, uh, feel free to go first. Sure. Um, look, I mean, I just think that Reshma just presented it in the most wonderful way, right? It's having in your investor somebody that above everything else shares your values and your objectives, I think is by far the most important thing. Far too many people spend time saying, yeah, but this is a big fund or this is a big thing. Well, it may be all of that, but the guy who's going to sit or the woman who's going to sit on your board, maybe an ex-lawyer or an ex-banker, nothing wrong with an ex-banker, I was an ex-banker, but the, who actually gets paid to manage risk, but you as an entrepreneur are there to take risk. And all they do is to try to hold you back. That would be the most awful investor for you if your ambition is to go forward. You want an investment like you, just like Reshma just demonstrated, who takes, tells you that how much can you go further, faster, better, if that's who you are. So look, I can, God forbid, divorce my wife. And we've been together for over 30 years, so there's no plan in there. But I'm just saying I can do, but I cannot divorce my investors until I leave my company. And I am always surprised by how easily we accept somebody's check just because they want to give you a check, right? We never took uh, any VC money in our business 
partly because we just thought that it will take longer to build our business than the time frame of most VCs. Nothing wrong against VCs, you just have to think about, we need a lot of capital. So we started with persuading a brilliant growth fund like Shinevik to come earlier than they used to come. I think we were perhaps one of the earliest investors they did, investments they did in terms of the stage they came in. Uh, so I think it's really important, choose your investors, as you choose your most important executive and, and your most important partners. Uh, and I think that will work out. Where there is a divergence in values and attitude between investors and companies is actually one of the biggest risks to the companies. Uh, so where that's where you see the departure, the boardroom, horribleness. And, and also you will make mistakes. There's no question you will make mistakes and you will allow in some wrong investors. You should be clinical at purging those investors out, right? You should be, you should do everything you can at the earliest sign that they're the wrong investor for your business to get them out. Uh, and and the big, as I said, it's like a team. Make sure your every member of your team is suited for the way you want to play. Thank you. Alexander? First, I, I can only agree with what I just said, but um, I think maybe th three, three points uh, I think on that, so I think the first one is um, you, you really want to have investors around you that you feel because of course it's tough to know exactly beforehand, but you feel they're going to be there, you know, in, in the good, but also in the bad times. So uh, fortunately so far we've, we've had some pretty good times with Conzo, but, uh, but I hope if we have some trouble in the next few quarters or years that, you know, investors will also be, be there and be uh, helpful and, and trying to be positive. So that's the first thing. I think the second thing is we, we want to make sure our investors are, are boosting us. So let's say challenging us in a, in a constructive way, but also like helping us, um, let's say, go for it and, you know, and, and go big basically. And, and sometimes, especially in Europe and especially in some cultures, maybe sometimes the, the, you know, people say that the French culture are a bit like risk averse and so on. And I think having uh, also non-French investors on, on, you know, around us has helped us dream big, dream, you know, for Europe at least, and maybe even the world and so on. And so I think this is also uh, very helpful. And the, the third point is, uh, I think when you, uh, when you sign a term sheet, especially in, you know, seed round or series A, so quite early on in the, uh, in the company, uh, in the company's, uh, you know, story, uh, it's important to know that, uh, as Ali was mentioning, these investors will, will stay forever, let's say, or at least for a very long time with you, but also are, 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 can be partners for future investors. So it's also interesting to see how the investors you're, you know, you're committing with are seen by the um, VC community and other investors, because it, it's, of course, uh, a signal, not only the brand or the VC fund, but also the, the individuals, because as we know, it's, it's a lot about people in the end. And like, you know, when you have a board uh, meeting with like five or six or seven people, it's a lot about like personal dynamics and not only like what fun is behind those, uh, those people. All right. And Alexander, you're the number one contender this year. So, so hopefully no pressure there. Um, <laughs> maybe no pressure, but it's good pressure. Yeah. Um, maybe staying with you for a second, but the question uh, is also just to um, Ali and to Julie. How has COVID impacted your business? Well, sh shall I start, Ali? Well, let, let's, start, let's stay with uh, Alexander and then we move to, to Ali and then uh, with you, Julie, if that's okay. Uh, so, of course, we, um, we, we, we saw a huge impact, uh, especially with the lockdown. So it's not really the, the you know, of course, the, the COVID-19 uh, itself, but more the lockdown. So the payment volumes were hit probably down 50%, 40 to 50% or so. So a huge impact. Um, uh, luckily, or let's say, fortunately, we, we didn't uh, suffer so far from a lot of... Um, uh, SME bankruptcies, of course, the, the governments in all countries where we're active in Europe have been super active at, at you know, um, uh, having some, some great incentives and great help uh, for all SMEs. So I think so far, so good, but we expect 
that it's going to be probably a bit worse in the coming months and, and quarters. And the good news is uh, uh, in the past few weeks, we've seen a very, very sharp uh, rebound. And we're now uh, on, on, you know, above the levels we had in, in February or March. And so um, in terms of like the numbers, COVID-19 is, is behind us. Of course, we might see some, some later effects, but, uh, but so far it's, uh, it's, 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 really, uh, it's really behind us. And of course, as with many uh, digital uh, businesses, it might even help us in the midterm because it's even more shift from traditional banks with branches and so on to uh, purely online players. Well, that's very encouraging. Thank you, Alexander. How about you, Ali, having been in the forefront of, of healthcare? I think in healthcare, what, uh, what COVID did was to, to fast forward the digitization of healthcare by years. Uh, what would have happened in years happened in months, right? Uh, and that was encouraging. What was, what was more important, and I think for this audience is, is, is a more important observation, is that what we saw was it also demonstrated, at least that's what I saw or my conclusion, is that what is real technology versus what isn't. My definition of what is a technology and therefore gives it value is its ability to provide a scalability and operational leverage. So for instance, I'm not a big believer that telemedicine is a tech play. I just think a doctor behind a mobile phone is uh, cost the same, is as scalable and as rare as a doctor in a clinic. It's just them behind the mobile phone, right? So what you saw, for instance, what COVID saw, and I just came off the phone with a client in the United States where they were using telemedicine uh, providers, and they showed that, look, all that happened was that these guys had needed more and more doctors and they were scrambling to get more doctors in to do more slots, right? But there's a finite number of doctors in the world. What we saw was that our numbers massively went up but we did not need to add a single doctor to our platform because we managed to get 80% of our patients just use our tech solutions, the AI, the monitoring, all of those things that was highly scalable to deal with their problems. So my biggest takeaway in my sector of, of this was that yes, on one hand, it fast forwarded the things, but on the other hand, it commoditized what would have dragged on for a very long time to get commoditized fast. But it also taught us that, look, you cannot be in a, take the old model of doing business, add technology in it, and call it a new model of doing business. That's just no value added. What you have to do is if you do something with technology, you have to make it significant and use technology for what it is, which is make it highly more scalable an operational leverage. Um, I mean, that was, that was probably the most important thing that came out of it for us. Well, that's, uh, that's brilliant, Ali, and truly heroic uh, push uh, and impact, uh, especially at these uh, challenging times. And then moving on to, to Julie, um, how do you see the, the conference landscape um, in a world of social distancing? How were you able to adapt? Well, the event ecosystem and the event sector, I think, was one of the most uh, hardly hit, uh, along with tourism and our aeronautics, maybe. But it was quite a hard hit, especially for Vivatech, as uh, we have one event uh, per year, and we gather 124,000 visitors. So obviously, we could not um, host it uh, last March. But it also forces us to have uh, more creativity and to invent a new form uh, and new formats for our event. Um, what I strongly believe that the future of event is, is that it's going to be a hybrid format. That is to say both a physical event and a digital event, because it's been indeed, as Ali just said, uh, a tremendous acceleration of use in digital tools. But I don't think the digital formats will replace at all uh, the events. I mean, it's very nice to all be here today to talk through this webinar, but I would be so much more happy to meet you all and shake hands and uh, have a drink after this, uh, this discussion. Uh, and I think also that would maybe uh, lead us to engage co collaboration and partnerships that is hard to engage in when it's only a digital format. So we are uh, thinking about this hybrid version 
And, and I like what Ali just said. It's like when you imagine a digital service, you just don't take what you do and add digital on it. I mean, you have to imagine what is going to be the experience? What is your purpose? I mean, my purpose as VivaTech is to make sure that people get inspired by the most inspiring speakers and um, loud companies, that they meet uh, with the right people to engage new collaboration that will help them transform uh, their business and accelerate their growth. And I want them to invent together solutions that we have uh, a positive impact on society and on environment. And how can I do that on the digital? And th that's a big challenge. And that's what we are thinking about in the months to come with, the, with my team. But that's also very, um, I mean, challenging. And we also like the, the challenge. Well, great, Julie. I mean, you guys done a fantastic job adapting into this um, new norm. So as we are coming towards the end of the panel, perhaps um, another question to um, Ali and uh, Alexander, starting with Ali, perhaps. Um, what advice uh, do you have uh, to the next generation of founders, someone who's looking to start his business or hers um, today? Um, uh, I was once uh, uh, fortunate enough to talk to a very, very successful um, uh, political campaigner. And uh, he, it happened to be a he, he told me that once you're sick of saying the same thing, you physically feel ill by saying it it's the time that people have started hearing it. So I'm gonna repeat and finish with what I started from. And the advice I have for the early people is exact, well, for uh, other entrepreneurs is that, um, look, it takes as much time to build something small as it does to take, build something big. So dream big. Uh, life is incredibly short. And as uh, Reshma says, it takes 10 years before you even matter. And we all kind of get excited by this word, the unicorn. Frankly, it's an artificial boundary. And because it's become an artificial boundary, everybody tries to push it. Look at how many companies are just worth over a billion dollars, right? So, I mean, they don't get excited about that. But to really matter, to really become what you guys call a titan or a company that touches a lot of people, that just takes time. So be fast, have a sense of urgency. And, and finally, anything that is built on bad foundations will always fall apart, right? I mean, I'm an engineer by background, a physician, called civil engineer. That was my degree. And you just know foundation of your property is everything you do, right, of your buildings. So get, get those bits that Steve Jobs used to say, if you can build the part of the computer that nobody sees beautifully, everything else is right. Get the bits right. Um, and the one final thing I say, because I talk to many entrepreneurs, just, just one-to-ones on, on just if they have a question or something. One thing I'm increasingly interested in getting people say to me is this view about popularity. Like, I mean, people say, well, I'm meant to make a tough decision. This decision would make people upset. I mean, that old adage that if you want popularity, sell ice cream. Uh, that, that is really true. You have to make the decision that is right for the company as a whole. And if that means you have to make an unpopular decision or be unpopular, that's not the job of an entrepreneur. You're not a celebrity, you got a job. And uh, I always kind of count entrepreneurs' success in reverse order of how many conferences and events they try to kind of attend. I just think your job is to build something and building sometimes is an unpopular uh, set of decisions, if that makes sense, right? And the final with that, I finished with that compassion, right? Um, I unfortunately lost my father to COVID uh, and, and I had never lost a parent before and it was the toughest thing I ever had to do, right? I, or would go through. Talking to me about my performance a week after or two weeks after was irrelevant. Professional is personal. So have empathy and compassion for your people. You'll be amazed, amazed how people will pay you back if you're fair uh, and compassionate. Thank you, Ali. And my personal condolences uh, on your loss. Um, and thank you for those uh, truly inspirational words. Um, Alexander, what's your take? Um, my, my, my number one was exactly dream big, so I'll, I'll go fast on this one but I think it's uh, it's true and, and having myself founded two companies I can see that um, you put anyway the same amount of energy and 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 you know you have the same amount of stress and whatever 
uh, whether the, the market is big or small, whether the team is big or small. I mean, of course, you have differences, but you'd rather dream big and, and try and solve a big problem in a big market because in the end, it's going to be a lot of work anyways. Uh, I think the second point is, um, I, I, I think people often have the idea that they need more experience or more, you know, they need to get a, a regular job to um, understand better something, and then it will be the right time for them to, uh, to found their, their company. I think uh, probably it's the other way around, like, as you know, the, the younger, the easier, probably. Uh, and, and so um, don't hesitate too much, you know, you shouldn't think too much about trying to build a company, especially because now it's easier to, uh, to do that, potentially to succeed or to fail, but then you're, the next one would be the right one and so on. So uh, again, the, the younger, the better. Um, the, the third point is um, we discussed a lot about how to, you know, choose or how to, you know, see whether an investor will be a good investor for you or not. I think the, the, even more important than the investor is uh, the team and especially your co-founder or co-founders. In my case, um, I've been fortunate enough to have a, a great co-founder. Uh, this is a second business we're building together. And this is really great to be able to work you know, hand in hand with someone, uh, again, in the great times, but also in the very, you know, lows. And we've had lots of lows. So it's, it's great to, to, you know, to have him uh, beside me uh, at, you know, at any time. And the, the last point I wanted to share is that when we got started, um, and uh, especially mentioning Conto, everyone around us was saying this was a really bad idea. And now everyone seems to be saying, well, this is an obvious idea. And so, <laughs> and so I think um, you, you shouldn't be listening too much at people when you are sharing your idea because you might not be expressing it super well or, and that what's happened most is that you actually talk to this, about this idea to your friends and family. And sometimes they're not the best position people to you know, tell you what they think, or they're actually biased because they're afraid that your company is gonna be you know, a failure. And so they don't want you to you know, to go in that direction and they rather have you stay in a, you know, in a safe, let's say, job. And so I think you shouldn't be looking or sorry, um, hearing too much or listening too much to what people around you are saying. That's the, my last, last advice, let's say. Follow your own internal compass. Exactly. And now for the final, final question, um, and we can continue this all day, but we're just running a little bit out of time. Um, Question to Reshma. Um, what advice do you give uh, founders um, and entrepreneurs um, when they're out there pitching to VCs? What are the do's and don'ts? Yeah, and I think, um, I mean, obviously we're coming at a, uh, in a in, it's a different time sort of for, from, you know, the heyday of, of the last few quarters in, in 2019. So I think we, we generally are seeing caution um, across the board. We see our companies raise everything from Revolut, you know, 500 million, and the week before, uh, week before lockdown to 500K. Um, so I think across that we see caution, but we also equally see a massive flight to quality. So I think sort of a great focus on metrics, you know, founder quality, sort of uh, we call positive bias sectors as, as, as well. Um, obviously health tech and, and others more, you know, and with Hopin, as you might've seen the the sort of round, round that just happened is, you know, there is that there is that flight to quality, and in those cases, it's easier than ever to to raise and 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 raise different amounts of amounts of capital, and for sure those founders are in a, in a very privileged position. So I think a kind of couple of pointers on on dues is you got to do your homework. I think there's you 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 showed how much capital there is um, from you know growth VCs even even in that stage to sovereign wealth funds and everyone's pushing earlier there's just a lot more capital so i think do you know the smartest founders do their homework really well of who fits kind of what the size the the people who are involved what their experience is what the you know they do their dd with other founders who take in their money so i think do a, do a lot of that homework and I, my last point is i think you need to be brutally you know, honest with yourself and, and have a brutal self assessment of where do you rank? Cause it is a competition. Um, at the end, there's, there's only so much of a wallet of any, any fund and, and they're always choosing and, uh, of where to put and where not to. So, you know, again, um, 
rank yourself sort of across your, your metrics um, and, your, and your quality as a fundraising team, as well as an execution team. Because I think we, we, did, we for sure have some companies which do really well on execution and just have a very tough time fundraising. So you've got to look, at, look in the mirror and, um, and, and, uh, and have that brutal conversation with yourself as a, as a core team before you get out there with a real plan to, uh, to address fundraising. And the last point I'll say is things are getting very sophisticated. You know, I see kind of, we're helping one of our companies fundraise for an A now, and you see how the two or three of us seed investors have come together and it's a machine like we're, we're putting together for this, for this series A. So, you know, that is happening out there in the market. Um, there's a lot more sophistication than, a, than five years ago or a decade ago. Uh, so, so it's tough, it's tough out there. Awesome, thank you, Reshma for those tips. And thank you for this uh, wonderful panel. Uh, this has been great. With that, uh, I'll hand it over back to Jade. Thanks, Alon. So hi, everyone. With that, we've reached the end of today's session. Thank you to Ali, Alexander, Reshma, Julie, Manish, Alon, and Alessandro for the extremely insightful and interesting conversation from today's Titans of Tech online event. And of course, a massive thank you to all our attendees for dialing in. You'll receive a follow-up email with a link to download the Titans of Tech report, as well as a recording of today's webinar. For those who have submitted questions, unfortunately, due to the time restrictions, we haven't been able to cover these, but please feel free to email events at gpbullhound.com and we will reach out to our speakers on your behalf to continue the conversation. We look forward to welcoming you to another of our online events very soon. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day. Bye.